So I thought I'd give a pretty generalized talk today. And um, as soon as I began to prepare it, it got more and more specific. But um, I wanted to start out by talking about what we do in my lab. And basically, what we do in my lab is known as um, structural biology. And um, what I'd like to say, for me, structural biology is a view of life at the molecular level. And what we're interested in, we're interested in understanding is how biological molecules work. Because you know that structure is function, as we say in biology. It's the structure of molecules that uh, allows them to uh, function as they do in biology. And if you want to know how an engine works beyond the fact that you put gasoline in your car and your car runs, you have to take that engine apart and you have to understand how those pieces hook together. And that's what we're interested in my lab. And what brought me to this was, uh, in graduate school, one of the first things that I, I studied as a biochemistry graduate student was the biosynthetic process um, that we use to synthesize cholesterol. And this was, to me, a terrific, terrific illustration of how um, just incredibly powerful enzymes are, because they catalyze the chemical transformations that are necessary to support life. And if we look at something like cholesterol, it's an incredibly complex molecule with 27 carbons in it. And yet, somehow, biosynthetically, we're able to synthesize this in a complicated pathway from two carbon units. And if we were to do this in a laboratory, this would take all kinds of uh, major heats. We'd have to have high pressure or heat things up to 100 degrees Celsius. And obviously, that's not an option when we synthesize bio things biosynthetically. These have to be synthesized at a process that supports life. We have to be able to synthesize things such that we don't create uh, waste products like we do in a laboratory that are harmful to living systems. And so how do we do this? We do this because we have these molecules called enzymes. And it would be really nice to know what they look like. So I was uh, attracted to the field of X-ray crystallography, which allows us to determine the three-dimensional structure. So this is the three-dimensional structure, not out of my lab, but of the enzyme that initiates the synthesis of cholesterol. And while you just get a nice, pretty picture here with some pretty ribbons, and it really doesn't explain the process. Um, so I'm not interested in structure for just pretty pictures. I actually really want to know how things work. And uh, besides um, solving, uh, being basically some sort of intellectual curiosity of how things work, there's some practical reasons you might want to know what these things look like. And that's shown here on this slide. When we blow up uh, here on this enzyme here, this HMG GoA reductase, which starts the synthesis of cholesterol, this is a surface rendering. And what we've done, done now is in this picture, I've blown up on the active site of that enzyme, the enzyme that actually performs the chemistry. And that blue molecule in six there is a statin. So statins are used to treat high cholesterol, and they work, work by uh, eliminating our ability to synthesize cholesterol de novo. And so basically, besides getting to know what things work, what look like and how they work, there's a very practical aspect to understanding how what molecules look like and how they function, because sometimes it can allow us to make better drugs. That what we want is a statin that just stops this molecule and not a mo another molecule and doesn't have side effects. So um, again, so in my lab, what we're interested in then is, as I say, structural biology. We want to know how enzymes work, and we want to know this for some very practical reasons. And so what are the actual biological processes that we concentrate on in my lab? Well, Gus talked to you today about a lot of things about um, antibodies. And antibodies, of course, are our defense against uh, uh, viruses. But we have another defense system that we refer to as the innate immune system. And unlike antibodies, which are nice and specific, and they're made to take out the flu virus, and they're snipers, they're going to only take out the flu virus. They're so specific that the next year when the flu comes around, they don't know that flu virus anymore. Okay, So they're snipers. But we also have this nonspecific uh, response to uh, what we perceive as invaders. And so these are more like a bunch of hotheads with AK-47s, and they'll fire at anything. And that is our inflammatory response. So if you have this, uh, we have in the capillaries, we have this, our blood flowing in the capillaries. And say you rupture your skin because your epithelial barrier is breached. And maybe it's breached by a splinter. Or maybe it's a surgical instrument that's been sterilized. But no matter what, 
what you do then is immobilize your inflammatory response. And it, what it does is respond. And it starts to fire because what it, what it thinks is there may be invading microbes on that splinter or on that surgical instrument. And so that's called inflammation. The hallmark of inflammation is you get this swelling and this redness and this pain and, um, uh, and heat generated then when you, when you have this cut. And that's caused by three things. The first thing that you have is the capillaries become dilated to increase the blood flow. And then sometimes you get this leakage of proteins outside of the vasculature into the tissue, and that causes swelling. And then you have neutrophil immigration. So neutrophils are our white blood cells that are there to basically uh, 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 immobilize or find these invading microbes and uh, uh, destroy them. And so this process then sets them into motion, and we have uh, then this activation. Now, so uh, inflammation is a very important response and physiologically, and there are many, many players in this. And that's the reason I'm showing the next slide. It's got a lot of stuff on it, but I don't really care that you look at all the stuff. The only thing I want you to get out of this is there are a whole lot of molecules that play a role in inflammation. And the molecules we're interested in are known as um, lipid mediators. They are derived from arachidonic acid, which I'm going to show you in a minute, and they're synthesized by enzymes, and we're looking at those enzymes. And one class of these, of these lipid mediators are called leukotriene. And what they do is once your body starts synthesizing these things, basically they're a chemoattractant, and they will cause more neutrophils to come to that site, and they'll amplify that swelling and make it worse. And again, bringing more neutrophils so you can so start consuming these invading bacteria. Now, people used to think that inflammation just started and then it just kind of burned itself out. You know, so you swell up and you, and you get all these neutrophils and they start eating up all this bacteria and then it just dies off and you get better again. But really, that's, there's another phase and it's called the resolution of inflammation. And so, um, again, this is a, uh, too much information on this slide, but I want to show you this slide for one reason. And that is, what I'm going to tell you is that you have a phase that you start out with the inflammation, so you respond to the invaders, and then you have this resolution of, of, of inflammation. So that's this process here. So here's where you make pro-inflammatory mediators. These are things like the leukotrienes that I'm going to talk to you about. And then you make these things like pro-resolving mediators, okay, which have other names like pro-lipoxins, et cetera. But basically, the reason to show you this is because you hear a lot in the news about why things like omega-6 versus omega-3 fatty acids. Well, the arachidonic acid that we use to synthesize these molecules, in order to make arachidonic acid, we have to have polyunsaturated fatty acids in our diet. And this is the reason we have polyunsaturated fatty acids in our diet. So if the polyunsaturated fatty acids are what they call omega-3, they are precursors to the inflammatory compounds, the red compounds right here. If the fatty acids are omega-6, they are the precursors to the resolving complex compound. So basically, it's this, ba this balance of uh, polyunsaturated fatty acids in our diet that plays a very important role in our ability to shut off inflammation, to control inflammation. Because if we don't control inflammation, uh, uh, inflammation, it's like you send the firefighters to a house, they pull out their hoses, they put the fire out, but if they don't turn their hoses off when the fire's finished, then they start destroying the house. And so again, you have these hotheads with AK-47s, and they start destroying your own tissue. And that's why chronic inflammation is known as the secret killer, because it's actually linked to many diseases, many pathologies, is uh, basically an unchecked inflammatory response. So we're interested in the proteins that make these inflammatory compounds. And one of them is this protein. Hey, keeps flipping on me. OK, 5-lipoxygenase, all right? So this is the enzyme that is going to start the synthesis of leukotrienes, these pro-inflammatory um, molecules. And it floats around here in the cytoplasm. And then in response to a stimulus, where the stimulus is actually calcium, all right, it binds to the nuclear membrane. 
Now, its substrate is this molecule right here, a polyunsaturated fatty acid known as arachidonic acid. And normally, arachidonic acid, where it lives and physiologically, is it's one of these tails of the phospholipid head groups, of the phospholipids in the membrane. And so we have another enzyme that's activated by the calcium signal called phospholipase A2, and it cleaves off that arachidonic acid so that 5-lipoxygenase can use it as a substrate. But 5-lipoxygenase has to pick it up from a little helper protein here called 5-lipoxygenase activating protein, which we just call FLAP. Okay? And then it takes the arachidonic acid out of FLAP and it converts it to this compound here. I'll say the name of it, but you just have to remember it as HP. It's hydroperoxy, iposatetra, you know it's acid. But we call it HP. It's a peroxide on this arachidonic acid. And then in the same active site, it converts this to a molecule called leukotriene A4. Leukotriene A4 was first discovered by um, in um, extracts of bronchial tissue that as what, and basically what happens is it promotes the uh, bronchoconstriction. So in other words, leukotriene A4, the product, the downstream products of that are one of the things that induce asthma, bronchoconstriction, smooth muscle cells. So what that tells us is if we can kill this activity right here, we can maybe come up with a drug to treat asthma. Okay, so this enzyme is called a lipoxygenase because it puts a peroxide on a, um, on a lipid. The lipid has to be a polyunsaturated fatty acid. In this case, uh, in humans, it's arachidonic acid. And the way it works is it needs this structure here, this uh, central carbon here, it lies between two double bonds, and it starts by pulling off one of these hydrogens, and then with a free radical, and you get this peroxide. And the peroxide is put on a carbon, two carbons removed from where it started the abstraction. So if you see arachidonic acid right here, you can see there are three chemically distinct, three chemically identical carbons. Yet 5-lipoxygenase only attacks here. And humans have other lipoxygenases as well. As we have a 15 lipoxygenase, and we have 12 lipoxygenases, etc. So basically, if you were to do this reaction in a laboratory, and you were just going to give this molecule peroxide, you would get peroxide adding to 12 different positions. But these enzymes somehow can tell this carbon from this carbon. 5-lipoxygenase attacks here at carbon 7, and it puts the peroxide at the 5. 15 lipoxygenase attacks here at carbon 13 and puts it on the 15. So what about 15 lipoxygenase? We're interested in that enzyme too because that enzyme has been shown to play a role in another um, uh, or one of um, another pathology related to chronic inflammation, and that is the development of atherosclerotic plaques. So these are plaques in the vasculature that sit down. And basically, they narrow the arteries, so it restricts blood flow. And then if they become dislodged, you might suffer a stroke or, or a heart attack. So what do these have to do with 5-lipoxygenase? And what do these have to do with the inflammatory system? So you have these white blood cells known as macrophages. Like neutrophils, they go around um, in eating up uh, perceived invaders or perceived threats to your physiology. And one of the things that they will consume are these um, oxidized low-density low lipoproteins. So these are normal things physiologically, and if you've got high blood cholesterol floating around, you've got tons of these guys floating around in your plasma. So here, the macrophage will consume these things, and then they turn into what are called foam cells. These foam cells plot, uh, um, play out and make plaques. And that's what happens when you restrict blood flow, et cetera, and it leads to heart attack. So it leads to cardiovascular disease. And the activity of 15 lipoxygenase uh, actually has been linked to um, uh, the development of atherosclerosis. So here you can see an artery in, in a clogged artery in a mouse model system of atherosclerosis. And what it, this is showing, you can see how it gets thinner and thinner as you plate out these foam cells and uh, narrow what the blood can flow through. So obviously, this is going to be a problem. So what that means is that both of these enzymes are actually targets for drug design. But if we're going to target a drug, a pro, an enzyme, and we're going to kill it, 
then obviously we want to make the drug specific and only kill the one enzyme, right? Because that's how you get side effects. You can't just take something that kills all iron enzymes. These are iron enzymes, or you lose a lot of good processes as well. So we have these enzymes, 15 lipoxygenase 2 and 5 lipoxygenase, that um, both of them are targets for drug design. So the crystal structures of these proteins were solved in my laboratory, the first by Nathan Gilbert and the second by Matt Kobe. And you can see the overall structure here of these enzymes. And what you can get from this rendering is just a couple of things here. So we have uh, one domain here, it's all beta structure, and this alpha helical structure, and this little orange sphere is the iron. And these are iron enzymes, and so this is where all the business is going to go on. Now, if you look at where the pink and the green are, you can kind of see that they pretty much overlay. So these are enzymes that both take arachidonic acid and turn it into a uh, poly, uh, a, an H peat, okay? They both put a peroxide on a, what they put it on different places in the uh, arachidonic acid. But they have the same catalytic machinery and the same substrate, but they make a different product. And as you would expect, they belong to the same enzyme family. They look very much alike, and they look like other lipoxygenases. You can see where the pink and green they pretty much lie on top of each other. These little blue spheres are calcium ions, and I'll talk about those later. But there's one place right up here where you can see there's a big difference. This green one and this pink one, they're definitely diverged, but all the other high helices are, are, uh, lie on top of each other. And if we rotate and we just look at that position, here again, you can see how different they are in this particular, in this very small region, whereas most of the other pro part of the protein, these are 700 amino acids, these proteins, um, uh, they um, look very much alike. But we have this very, uh, what looks to be a minor difference here, and it's quite near the active site because we can see the iron sphere here. So the consequences of this different structure are actually pretty profound. They make a very big difference in the active sites of these enzymes. So remember, the active sites of these enzymes are both, they're both going to recognize the exact same substrate. They have to both have the exact, going to perform the same catalytic reaction. They're just going to hit a different carbon in that substrate. So this is the 15 lipoxygenase structure, and this is a surface rendering where all the green then is the surface of the cavity, and then I've sliced through it. And what you can see is this little curved thing in here. This is actually an inhibitor, and it binds in the active site like a mimic. It, mim it sits there very much like arachidonic acid to sit in there as a substrate. But what you can see is the site is continuous and kind of get out. So in other words, this is open to the um, this is open to solvent. This is open. This is an open active site, and this guy just has to slip in there and get operated on. This is the 5 lipoxygenase active site, the contours of it. And you can kind of get out from this walrus shape here that there is no opening to the active site. So we don't really know. This is a completely enclosed cavity, and we don't know how the, two, um, the substrate gets in in this one. So we have this very similar enzymes, but we have very uh, different things going on here. We have an accessible active site versus a non-accessible active site. And again, this is just from that very small shift in that placement of the helix. So you can see the green one is the one that's open, and the, the inhibitor is bound in there, and the pink one is the one that's closed. And this guy is sitting, this inhibitor is sitting right where that pink helix is, and there wouldn't be room to close it here. So we have two very different, uh, basically, access portals to the active site. So even though they're very much alike, they have some differences. And we might be able to exploit these differences to um, come up with a way to try and selectively inhibit one. OK, so they use the same substrate, but one makes a 15 and one makes a 5 out of the same product. So what do our uh, structures tell us about that? Well, chemistry has told us for a long time before we saw these fish structures that What's very likely going on is the reason one can make 5 and the one can make 15 is in one of them, arachidonic acid uh, binds. Uh, in the two enzymes, arachidonic acid binds in inverse orientation. So what do I mean about that? Here's a schematic with arachidonic acid right here. Here's the carboxyl group and the methyl end. And this little guy here is supposed to tell you the end of the active site. So it scoots in methyl end first. 
And here's the catalytic iron. It's what's responsible for pulling off this hydrogen. And then on the other side of the substrate is where the oxygen is going to come in. So these are on two opposite sides of the substrate. And if that's the case, it goes in methyl N first. Then we put the peroxide group here on carbon number 15. Five carbons in from the tail, right? Now let's invert that substrate right here and put the carboxyl in first instead. So what do we have here? Instead of carbon number 13 being lined up right here, we have carbon number 7. And instead of carbon number 15 being lined up to get the oxygen, we have carbon number 5. So this one makes the 5 hydroperoxide, and this one makes the um, 15 hydroperoxide. So chemically, it makes a lot of sense. The stereochemistry of the products are the same. So let's look at our cavities and ask if it does it make any sense in terms of the structure. So here's our cavity of the 15 methoxygenase with the inhibitor. So the inhibitor is going to sit in there just like um, arachidonic acid. Now, what you can kind of make out, okay, so here's this foot going in the sock, right? And here's the iron. The iron is behind the plane of the board. And you see this little cavity right here? This is the oxygen access cavity. So the iron sits behind the, the substrate, and the oxygen comes in from the other side. And here, the arachidonic acid is going to sit right in here, and we can just pull this substrate out completely into the cavity. So that makes total sense here. So let's look at our 5-lipoxygenase structure. Well, we have a problem. First of all, our 5-lipoxygenase is closed right here. It's closed because it has these amino acids poking in here, and we don't have this upper portion of the cavity. But if we look at the lower portion, remember I told you that the carboxyl is going to have to go in first for the 5. Really nicely make out that maybe this little fork here can accommodate a carboxyl. And what's really more interesting is that in 5 lipoxygenase, there's actually a positively charged amino acid here, which would neutralize that carboxylate. But first, let's look at the 15 lipoxygenase and what we can say about that. So when we solve the structure of the 15 lipoxygenase and this type of surface rendering I'm showing it, so I always think of these things looking like horses. But that's my weird view of the world of biology, I guess. But anyway, this uh, 15 lux glue came out looking more like a unicorn. It has this great big uh, horn sticking out of it. And the reason I've colored that um, red is because those are the amino acid prolines. So if you remember, prolines are very rigid, and um, you don't rotate around those very easily. So in other words, this is a pretty rigid horn protruding from the head of this molecule right here. And behind there, there's some calcium. And what was really neat is that if we rotate around, you can see it's now poking at us outside the board. Here's the active site right here. Well, what we asked was, OK, and these are calciums. And this is calcium-dependent membrane binding. So we said, well, maybe these calciums are actually stabilizing this loop here. And this loop is going to poke into the membrane bilayer. And if that's possible, then we have the active site sitting up right next there to the bilayer. And so again, this is our phospholipid. And if this phospholipid carries an arachidonic acid on its tail, on one of, the, one of the fatty acids, maybe it could stick right in there. So we decided to test this hypothesis. And we did doing that, we used something called a nanodisc. And nanodiscs are biological mimics. They're mimics of biological membranes. And they were a really clever thing that was created by Steve Sliger, but I'm not going to go into how he did it. But basically, they're little, uh, they're little disks of bilayer. And they're coated by this protein, which is actually a, a mutated form of a biological protein, apolipoprotein B, which carries around cholesterol esters. Um, and basically, you, have these, you can make these particles. And you can make these particles of a defined diameter. And the good news is that you can put them on a size exclusion column. And just like a protein, you can run them down the size exclusion column. So what we did was we asked whether this protein would uh, bind to these nanodisks and whether it bound in the presence of calcium. And so in the absence of calcium, that is, we put ADCA in there, we have a peak on the sizing column from, for the nanodisk, because its molecular weight is around 300,000. And then we have a peak for the protein, which eludes at a molecular weight about 80,000. 
But when we add calcium, the protein peak now shifts over and migrates with the nanodisc peak. So we know what we're doing is actually binding to the nanodisc. Now, if its substrate is arachidonic acid, and I told you it goes in tail first, if the arachidonic acid is esterified on a phospholipid, maybe it doesn't need to be cleaved from the phospholipid, and it could, it could actually metabolize it down to the phospholipid. So we ask that, that's the truth, quest, if that's possible. And basically, um, I'm going to tell you, but I'm not going to explain all of this, but what we did was show that that is indeed the case, that if we give the protein phospholipid nanodisks with arachidonic acid in the side, in the chain, and we don't cleave the arachidonic acid, what we see, this is the product, and what we see that it's able, able of converting it to the hydroperoxide. So what this tells us is this guy can work directly on the membrane, all right? Now, I already told you that, how about 5-lipoxygenase? So let's think about 5-lipoxygenase. Well, 5-lipoxygenase doesn't have that option. One of the reasons it doesn't have that option is, remember, 5-lipoxygenase acts with its carboxyl innermost. So if it's still bound to a phospholipid, it has all this extra stuff on it, and we can't possibly fit it in this direction. All right? So there's no way in the world that 5 lipoxygenase can act at the bilayer on the esterified fatty acid. So that tells us we have a very distinct way of these two guys acting and getting their substrate. Okay, back. All right, so but let's go to 5 lox. Now the problem with 5 lox is we don't really understand how the substrate gets in there because its cavity is plugged. So this is modeled how the substrate we think it should sit in there. But again, because we don't see any cavity here, there's, these amino acids are occupying this space. There's no room for the whole arachidonic acid to sit in there. So our first question was, well, maybe it just becomes uncorked. And so we decided to test that. Now, this phenylalanine right here, if we look at the multiple structures available for different lipoxygenases, they all have a phenylalanine. It's conserved. But in all those other ones, the phenylalanine is sitting here and making room for the fatty acid substrate right here, which is shown here. But in our 5 lock, this phenylalanine is blocking it, and this tyrosine is blocking it. So all the other ones have this open active site. So we said, okay, well, let's just try and pull the cork out. We called this a cork, and we said, let's just try and pull the cork out. So we decided to do some mutations. If we pull the cork out, can we, make, um, can we get some understanding about how this protein works? Now, why is it corked in 5 lipoxygenase? Here's our cork right here. These are the corking amino acids. One of the reasons it can cork is because of this little guy right here. This is an alanine, and it's sitting very, very close to a tyrosine. If the alanine is the smallest amino acid besides glycine, and so the only reason this guy can sit in here is because it has this real small amino acid here. So we approach this question in two ways. We ask, well, let's trim the cork, and then let's just make the cork not be able to insert. And what happens? So we made some mutations. And the first was we trimmed the cork. Let's just make the tyrosine, this one, smaller, turn it into an alanine. Make the phenylalanine smaller, turn it into an alanine, and make the double mutant. And when we see that, the enzyme still makes, this is our product, so we have to uh, isolate our product by HPLC. And what we see is that these mutants still make our product, but what we see is when we trim the cork down, it makes the product even faster. All right? When we trim this uh, one down, so maybe this is the door that it gets into, right? So we've made the door easier to get in, and now it works even better. So now the substrate can get in and get out faster. But then we said, okay, so if that's true, we should be able to take this cork, and let's just make this amino acid so big that the cork can insert. So let's pop the cork permanently. So let's do that by turning this alanine here into a leucine, and that would bump this and not allow the cork to close. Now when we do that, that's the trace in the dark. And what you can see is there's basically nothing made there. Okay, this is noise. So in other words, we kill the enzyme if we don't let the cork insert. So we said, well, okay, so let's try to do this 
let's make this tyrosine smaller and make the, this one bigger and see if we can make the enzyme work again. So now we no longer prevent the cork from inserting. We make the cork, uh, allow the cork to insert because we've just made the cork a little smaller. And when we do that, we recover activity. So what does this tell us? Well, one thing it tells us that our corking metaphor for uncorking was a really crummy metaphor. And it really doesn't explain what's going on. That if we just uncork the enzyme, it doesn't work properly, all right? Because we can't make product with this uh, mutation. But if we trim the cork, it works just fine. So we think more, instead of being a cork, this is a twist and pour, okay? So the cork has to stay in there, and then we have to twist it around, and only then can we get into the active site. And that's what we think is going on here. Now, what I didn't tell you is that actually, so we have some ideas about how these two enzymes get their substrate. The enzymes, again, remember they use the exact same catalytic machinery. So if we make an inhibitor that just kills the catalytic machinery, we kill both enzymes. And that's not what you want for drug specificity. So you have to find differences between the enzymes. Well, we found really big differences here. We have this very different way in the way they get their substrate. But the question for how 5-LOX gets the substrate is actually even more complicated. And it means that not only do we address our questions in, uh, with biochemistry, and in vitro is we need to go into cells as well. And why is that the case? Well, I told you that 5 lipoxygenase picks up its substrate from a helper protein called FLAP. Now, nobody has ever been able to recapitulate this interaction in vivo. We hope to be able to do that, but at the point, at this point, it's not possible. So all of our assays, when we're trying to understand how 5-LOX gets its substrate, have to be done in the cell. Now, what this is, is simply showing you, I'm going to show you that this 5-lipoxygenase activating protein and this uh, and 5-lipoxygenase are both localized to the nuclear membrane. So in this, this is a nucleus of a cell. And if you know it's a nucleus because it stains blue, blue is for DAPI and it binds to DNA. This is an antibody that recognizes FLAP. It's staining, again, the nuclear membrane. And these are stimulated, that, the, that is, the calcium stimulated the 5 lock, So it's driven to the membrane. We also see that at the nuclear membrane. And if we put these all on top of each other, we see yellow. So what that tells us is the yellow and the, the red and the green are in the same place. So again, 5-lipoxygenase has been driven to the membrane to pick up its uh, substrate from FLAP. So what we're trying to do now is trying to reconstruct how that's possible and trying to understand that process of how 5-lipoxygenase gets its substrate from the membrane. So we have two very Similar systems, two very similar enzymes. One of them is this 15 lipoxygenase, which we think can actually metabolize arachidonic acid when it's still esterified to a phospholipid. What I've done here is just stick in a phospholipid. It's not quite sitting in there properly for various reasons. But you can see that you have this nice big hole. The phospholipid can be accommodated. If we look from the top, we have this cavernous hole where you could easily accommodate the phospholipid. In contrast, in 5-lipoxygenase, we have this cork. But again, the cork wasn't a very good sign because we think of uncorking bottles. So what we have is a twist insert. We have to move these guys for a twist and pour in order to be able to get into the active site and pick up uh, and, and work. Now, when um, FLAP, this protein that sits in the nuclear membrane, is shown here, it's a trimer. It has three different active, three different sites where it binds FLAP, and we're going to look down here, and where it binds the substrate, and it binds between these monomers. And so what we're trying to do now is trying to figure out how 5-lipoxygenase FLAP and FLAP actually interact. So we've built a model for that, which is total science fiction. And basically, this is FLAP. We're looking down at the membrane. And these little black circles here are where the arachidonic acid sits in FLAP. Remember, the lipoxygenase has two domains. Here's our 5-lipoxygenase. And it has a U-shaped active site. And what we think, then, is we also have some calcium binding residues in here and some membrane insertion residues. 
that they actually, this part inserts into the bilayer, then these two active sites line up, and somehow then 5 lipoxygenase can get um, the active site out, uh, uh, get the arachidonic acid out of the active site. So this is the model we're trying to test now through various um, methods. So we have, what we think we can do now in terms of uh, getting better drug designs is if we exploit the way, uh, the differences in how these enzymes acquire their substrates, maybe we can come up with a, with a strategy for making uh, drugs that inhibit selectively uh, one uh, enzyme or the other. Okay, so I was asked to talk about my career path, so I thought I would do that, do that literally. I started out in Charleston, South Carolina at the College of Charleston as a chemistry major because bio biology was just way too chaotic for my brain at that age. And um, I liked the order of chemistry, but it became clear that chemistry was not going to be interesting for a long-term career because I really didn't want to make things for treating fabric or whatever chemists do. I'm sorry to insult any chemists, but it didn't appeal to me at the time at all. I wanted to know about um, the chemistry of living systems, which has always fascinated me. So I went from Charleston, South Carolina to uh, Houston to study, to get my degree at Rice University. And it was there that I first was exposed to the world of structural biology. And I was totally fascinated by the technique of X-ray crystallography, which in those days was just almost completely different from how it is now. It's the same principle, obviously, but it's so much faster now that I look back and think, what made me want to think I wanted to do this when it went so slowly? But anyway, it's a lot more fun now. So when I was there, I um, learned structural biology, and then I became fascinated by the ribosomes. So I started moving more into biology. And I went to Uppsala, Sweden, um, to go work on the ribosome. But actually, when I went there, I actually got a little distracted from the ribosome, and I started a research program that I won't go into, but it had to do with uh, vitamin A and proteins and how, uh, how the different proteins that are involved in uh, transporting vitamin A. Vitamin A is a very greasy molecule, so you have to have proteins to help it do everything it has to do, and it does a lot more than mediate vision. So if you think about its role in vision, that's actually uh, less important than the other biological roles it fulfills, although I'm not saying it'd be nice to be blind. Okay, so then uh, I got a little, uh, four years of uh, long winters got too much for me, and I moved to Mexico City. And after two years in Mexico City at the university, National University there, um, I moved to Pullman, Washington. If you've ever been to Pullman, Washington, you know it's the polar opposite of Mexico City. It's a little town in eastern Washington, the home of Washington State University. And um, then I went to Nashville, Tennessee, where I spent 12 years on the faculty at Vanderbilt uh, Medical School um, doing structural biology of vitamin A proteins. And it was there that I actually started this program uh, on um, lipoxygenesis with a collaborator there in the pharmacology department. And then I moved from there to uh, Baton Rouge in 2001 because we have a really nice uh, x-ray facility here in Baton Rouge on Jefferson Highway. You can see the largest source of radiation from Whole Foods uh, if you go over there next time. Look around for a funny-shaped building uh, up Jefferson, and that is CAMD. And uh, it was there before Whole Foods, and I'm sure they don't advertise the fact that they're in the shadow of the largest source of radiation in the southeast. So anyway, I'd be happy to take questions. Questions? Well, while you guys are thinking, well, let me let me ask you one, Marcia. Yeah. So, so if 15 locks can work without a helper protein like FLAP, yes. What what are the thoughts on why five locks needs? Yeah, it's a really good question. Of why five locks needs a helper protein, and I should point out that there are actually several um, uh, inhibitors to FLAP um, that have made to phase three clinical trials. Um, for the treatment of asthma. But why it needs, um, it's, it's, nobody really knows. Oh, okay. 
There is one good reason. Okay, I'll show you what it is. I'm sorry. Though it's not uh, confirmed, one of the hypotheses is that, for one thing, Phylox is unique in a couple of ways. And in one way, it's unique is it actually catalyzes um, two reactions, two successive reactions. And um, if you don't have FLAP, in vitro, what you mostly see is this first reaction. It doesn't complete the reaction. So one of the ideas is, and this is actually what we're trying to do and how we're trying to reconstruct this complex, is that the five locks have to actually sit up against FLAP. And otherwise, this guy gets out of the active site and it doesn't, the reaction doesn't get completed. So in vitro, what you can, in vivo, what you can see is in cells which don't express FLAP. If you, if you knock down the FLAP expression, they cannot um, complete the reaction. And that's been shown also in, in um, expression systems. And we've shown that too in, in other experiments. So that's one of the reasons it may need FLAP. We think it, it's a matter of, we have other data now that are a little sketchy and we can't really, um, but it's, uh, we always get excited about the preliminary data because it's the thing that's the coolest. But basically what we think it is is there's actually, in that model I showed you that the FLAP and the, um, when the, when the active site uncorks, that actually flap helps cork things back together. Okay. That it helps complete that active site. That if we pull this cork out, so when we express um, when we express a mutant that lacks these two amino acids, when we express them, co-express them in hex cells, so in the cell system where we have flap, what we can what we see is that although normally we don't make leukotrienes when we take these two guys away, if you put flap there, you make leukotrienes. So what we think is that the flap actually helps this uncorking process. And that's and, what we need to look at. And the second reaction is happening in the same active site? In the exact same active site. Yeah. Okay, you guys had time to think of questions. So it's on you now. So you've shown us some really elegant 3D structures and pathways. How much time are we talking about? It, it looks like, okay, last week in our lab we did all this. Okay, so it, when I started out in crystallography, um, this is why I say when I go back sometimes I think, what made me think I wanted to do that? Well, so. If you can imagine, nowadays you have a lot of, um, you have, we have a lot more things than we had in my years ago, right? And so, uh, for one thing, you have interactive computer graphics. So one of the things you had to actually build these models, these protein models, out of wire amino acids, and you had to take an Allen wrench and screw the things together. Well, anyway, just stuff like that was so much slower. But also data collection was slower. Uh, uh, we didn't have so many facilities where we can take data so quickly, but nowadays it, there's been a, a huge increase in the types of, in the way we generate, there's a big improvement in the way we generate x-rays, in the way we measure the diffracted x-rays, and in the speed of computers. And what that means is that once you get crystals, you can go from crystals to a structure in less than a week. Okay. But the question is, how long does it take you to get crystals? Because that is another process. That involves a lot of skill and a lot of luck. Skill because you have to have really, really pure protein and a lot of it. And luck because you have to just screen. You have no idea what is going to cause your protein to make nice, beautiful crystals. And so basically, you have to try a lot of things. And it's all empirical. There's no way before. So hopefully, you can pick that. So, but now, um, crystal structures, uh, you know, I hate to say seven days because then it sounds like we're really slow because we're not putting one out every week, but um, uh, it, it's, uh, the, the rate limiting step is now the protein purification and the purification sample, and that can take years. Great, well, if there are no other questions, help me thank Dr. Newcomer. <laughs>